Folks, today uh, we come to 2 Samuel chapter 7 as we've been exploring some of the great chapters in the Word of God. This chapter uh, needs to be on the list because in it, the Lord God establishes a covenant with the house of David. And this is um, an eternal covenant. It has far-reaching implications right to our present hour. And uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit this week, um, and we hope you enjoy it. To get us started, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Neil's going to read verses 1 through 17 so we can get our context. All right. It says, And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in an house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. And have made thee a great name, <clears throat> like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which, thou, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Wow. Well, folks, let's consider uh, the content of this uh, revelation here. First of all, the setting is uh, noted in the first few verses. Uh, the king sat in his house. The Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Those of you familiar with your Bible, you know that David was a man of war. Uh, I think just last week we were talking about his encounter with Goliath uh, from his youth. You know, he, he was engaged in battle. And soon after, in his young adult years, you know, he was going to battle. Eventually, God bring him, brought him to the throne and established him. And he got to a season in his reign where he had a measure of peace. And that's what the Bible is talking about here. The Lord giving him rest round about from all his enemies. So David's looking around. He's prospered. He's at a place of peace. And uh, he said to the prophet Nathan. Now, it's interesting that the king had a relationship to the prophet. You know what I'm saying, Neil? I mean, he, he didn't have to search for somebody and say, you know, I got something on my mind. Could you find somebody? No, he knew Nathan. Matter of fact, Nathan, you know, is going to confront him mm -hmm. or... Uh, help me with the history here. My, uh, I, I think Bathsheba's yet to come. I right? think so. Yeah. All right. So Nathan will confront him later about that. But anyway, David knows Nathan. He's in conversation with him, calls him. And see, David feared the Lord. David worshiped the Lord. David served the Lord. And uh, he sought uh, the will of God and so forth. Well, he, he calls the prophet. He says to him, you know, I'm dwelling in this house of cedar. Uh, God has blessed me. I'm, I'm dwelling in a comfortable place. But folks, as David was looking at this situation, he says, now, I wish you'd look at this. I'm dwelling in this nice house and God's ark, the ark of the covenant, it's over here uh, within these curtains. 
It's like it's in a tent. And David just didn't feel right about that. Now, I want to point something out to you that is a basic spiritual lesson. It's a discipleship lesson here for followers of Christ. You ought to have some passion about the house of God. Now, we're not in the same circumstance. We don't live under the old covenant. We don't have uh, the obligation to go down to the tabernacle uh, or later the temple so forth. But the spiritual, you know, Neil, a lot of times folks, they don't. Can I encourage you to read the Old Testament? Obviously, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when he made that statement, the only scripture he had to reference was Genesis through Malachi, the Old Testament. Um, read it. The Old Testament is as much food for your soul as the new. You just interpret it in its historical context. Mm -hmm. So we're not under the old covenant per se, but all the, the spiritual lessons, there's, they're still vibrant. They're still very much needed and, and uh, we need to receive them. And so let's not worry about the letter of the law. Let's worry about the spirit. So what, what spiritual lesson can we gain from David's passion for the Lord? He looked around and he said, I want to tell you something. I'm dwelling in a house of cedar and God's house is over here in a tent. This isn't right. I'm going to build God a house. In other words, David's saying, I ought to treat the Lord at least as well as he's treating me. Now, are you with me on this thought here? Do you see what I'm talking about? Now, what can we learn from this as New Testament believers today? The New Testament refers to the local church as the house of God. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, you know, and Titus, he said, look, I, I got to help you so that you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about the local assembly of New Testament believers where pastors and saints and deacons assemble together. They have a local assembly. It could be in a building like this or otherwise. In New Testament times, they didn't really have buildings per se. They gathered in houses or whatever, but they treated it like the house of God. Now, I want to ask you something. What kind of passion do you have for the house of God? Would it matter to you if the doors were shut and the lights were turned out? Does it matter to you that the house of God can lay in disarray? But now you got you got your house. You take good care of yours. But you let God's house fall down. Well, just look at David. Here's a man who was after God's own heart. He had a passion about serving God. He's a good example for New Testament believers, by the way. And he said to the prophet, Nathan, we got a problem here. I'm dwelling in my house of cedar and God's ark. The significance of that, this is the presence of God. This is how we worship God. It's over here in this old tent. Mm -hmm. Neil, I think there's something here that we ought to mimic. I think there's something that ought to rub off on us about right now. Yeah, he obviously recognizes that, um, you know, the Lord has the one that's blessed him. And then he looks at where they're, you know, they would have to go there and worship, obviously, the tabernacle in some capacity. Um, and uh, he said, I, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't uh, the ark of the Lord dwell at least as good as what I've got, if not Amen. better, right? Amen. And, uh, you know, a lot of people will know the rest of the story. And, you know, Solomon was able to see that come to fruition, but... Uh, but it's his desire that we're looking at. He, he had a desire for the things of God Amen. and wanted to do something for him. Amen. Well, you and I need to have a passion about serving Christ. And, you know, the things that are dedicated to him belong to him. Uh, it just ought to flow out of our heart of love for Christ. I want to take care of what belongs to the Lord. What about you? You want to take care of what belongs to the Lord. You say, ah, well, now preach. No, there ain't no all well. If you don't want to take care of God's house, perhaps he won't take care of yours. You say, oh, well, now I'm a child of God. Yes, you are. I'm not talking. It doesn't change a thing. But do you want to experience God's faithfulness? Do you want to experience the fullness of God's blessing? Do you want God's work to prosper? These things matter, ladies and gentlemen. And they're going to play out in this temporal life in some measure. And they're really going to play out when we stand before Christ. Because the Lord said, if any man honor, honor me and serve me, him my father will honor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can thank every... Look, heaven is going to be a glorious place, a wonderful place. And all of God's redeemed are going there. So in a certain sense, we all have the same blessing in a certain sense. We're in the same place. But heaven's not going to be the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. You say, what do you mean? 
Christ is going to reward his people. His reward is not going to be the same for everybody. You can lose reward. You can receive reward. Uh, you're going to have a place in heaven. Study on that. It matters, ladies and gentlemen. Be passionate about the house of God. Take care of it. Look after it and see if God doesn't take care of yours. But don't treat his with less respect than you would treat your own. Buddy, old David, he's got a lesson here. Oh, mm -hmm. man. Okay. Now, as this is on his heart, David's saying, I'll tell you what, I'm going to build this house. But you know, Neil, the Lord didn't let him build that house, did he? Mm -hmm. He didn't let him. Right. And part of that, as we alluded to earlier, he, I mean, the Lord told me he's a man of war, right? Yeah. And he couldn't build the house. Uh, but he still has quite a, um, uh, an abundance stored up, I guess. And then Solomon ultimately gets to do it. But David still makes the preparation for it. That's very interesting. He does. Now, tomorrow when we return to this, we'll continue our conversation. But it's, it's in this setting as Nathan seeks the Lord. You know, the Lord speaks, speaks to Nathan, rather. And Nathan's going to bring this message back to David. Uh, the Lord told Nathan, said, go tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord. Now, it's in this setting that the Lord reveals to the world a covenant that he is establishing with the house of David. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? God established a covenant with a man who was passionate about serving him. He had his faults and failures. That's beside the point. You can't change his heart. He loved the Lord. And he was passionate in spite of his failures. And it's with that kind of man that God made an eternal covenant. And God uses this occasion to reveal to us a covenant that he has established with the house of David that's eternal. And it's connected to his people, Israel. My, this is very much real today. Well, I'm anxious to get there, but we're out of time. Now we're going to have to pick it up tomorrow if the good Lord wills. Read the chapter and join us tomorrow for our discussion. God bless you until then.